And now is the time to start recording before, before I, you know, I peak and then it's just all a kind of like the, the footnotes, the boring historical <laughs> footnotes. Cool. So I have right now with me Danny O'Brien. And, you know, for those who maybe don't know you or did not witness maybe the, the small um, <laughs> dramas on Twitter... I- our introductory <laughs> drama, yeah. For for those of you who don't know me, I was um, the person who uh, Evgeny Morozov, who runs the blockchain syllabus and the syllabus Crypt- too, crypto syllabus, I think, really great serv- services, crypto syllabus. That's right, and uh, also coined the term solutionism. A great techno utopian critic. <laughs> I met the blockchain socialist on Twitter around about the same time as Evgeny was denouncing me actually did you like you commenting about him ended up with him denouncing me for revealing private conversations i i tweeted something that did not mention him but i did it did use the word that he used in like a recent the recent essay recent left which is left washing left washing so this is the idea that um wasn't just to be clear it wasn't like specifically directed at him but he took it very personally very quickly right right so uh, yeah this is the idea that like people of the left who are involved in crypto stuff are kind of is the implication that you're kind of being paid to do it or like kind of just being used as cover i mean i get a lot of different type of criticisms of like i mean it's usually just like I don't know, a random account, which is like probably someone who's just extremely online and has, you know, these particular parasocial relationships with maybe other left wing celebrities right. who feel a certain way. And so um, their mind has already been made up about this particular thing. And so they, you know, of course, the first thing to to accuse someone else of being on the left is a CIA psyop or something like that. So right. <laughs> that was like kind of the thing that I was talking about. And then the, but I did use the word left washing, which, which, uh, it, yeah, this, this is, I should, I should segue neatly into the introduction of who I am because so far people will just know that I am a CIA psyop, I guess. So um, I've, I've, I've kicked around for a very long time. Um, I've been a digital rights activist and a journalist writing about, I guess, technological culture for since the mid nineties. Um, I did a one man show about the internet and the West end in, in like 1994, but then, but that's not what I'm known for. I, I I'm mainly known, I guess, because I went to the electronic frontier foundation for close on 10 years on and off. And actually, I mean, the weird thing for me is that when you, and we probably want to talk about this, I actually kind of attenuated my personal brand, um, as it were, in the last 10 years, um, because I, I, I find it, like you say, it's really hard to like untease who you are online with kind of the values that you represent or whatever. And at EFF, um, the organization itself has a pretty strong voice and I was doing a quite a bit of work kind of maintaining that voice and doing a lot of the strategic thinking. And so it was always kind of a distraction to actually be anyone outside of that. Um, so I've been relatively silent, but, and here's the hook. Um, I guess last year I moved from EFF to the Filecoin foundation and the Filecoin foundation for the decentralized web. So, that is a, in the current atmosphere, that is a big shift. And I tentatively, I was like, okay, let's, you know, I need to talk about this on Twitter. I'll start, you know, with a little light critique of the critiques of of Web3 or whatever. (laughs) And within like a six hours of my first hot take on crypto, um, I'd had Evgeny denounce me for being a crypto soldier. Um, uh, Charlie Strauss, uh, the science fiction author, saying that I had bent the neck to, I guess, big crypto. 
Um, and I think Jamie Zawinski, uh, uh, co-founder of Mozilla, creator of the first Netscape browser, popular nightclub owner, also joined in the denunciations. <laughs> and so I was like, uh, I guess this is this is the um, the world we live in now. Our polarized crypto versus everyone else uh, world. But but I'm kind of used to it, you know. Even when the the funny thing with EFF is that you know there are a lot of people who are kind of a, arraigned against the organization and or had strong feelings about things that we would do and i i got accused of being a cia agent i accused of being like the new carl rove um you <laughs> it kind of comes with the, the territory and the eff is the electronic uh, frontier foundation right so um to introduce that to eff has been around since 1989 um it was founded by john perry barlow who some people might know from the declaration of independence of cyberspace um uh, mitch kapoor who invented lotus 123 and john gilmore who was one of the uh, original uh cypherpunks um still is uh, he's, he's, he's around you bump into him in san francisco and uh it, I think it, it, it's sort of this, the easy pitch is that it was it, it was the kind of ACLU of the internet back when the ACLU wasn't doing internet things, um, and it would do public impact litigation. Uh, but I think more broadly, it's always been seen as kind of the um, ideological kind of think tank -y kind of organized lobbying kind of organization for what you might think of as like digital rights writ large. So protecting encryption, um, stopping online censorship, um, uh, sued the NSA over, kind of revealed and sued the NSA over the mass surveillance programs. Um, and also built technology too. So it, it kind of works. Um, it, it, it has a bunch of lawyers. So if you get into trouble and you're a hacker, like you should contact EFF on speed dial. Um, it has a bunch of activists. So do a lot of um, grassroots stuff about right now the Earn It Act. Um, uh, and, uh, and also technologists. So if you're a tall techie, um, the fact that you can get free certificates, HTTPS certificates to turn on encryption for a, for a website is, um, a project that, uh, EFF sort of, uh, works on and builds with, uh, a bunch of other, other groups. So it's sort of like a, a think and do tank. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Think and act, <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, uh and sue. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and so then I'm curious, like, because, yeah, going to something like Filecoin Foundation is to to some people to like maybe like the Web3 enthusiast eye. It's sort of like, oh, you're you're moving to Web3. You're like joining the, the revolution. And then to like you said, <laughs> like earlier of like a lot of the critics, like, oh, you're going over to you know, the, the evil side in some ways. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you have to put this into a sort of time scale of stuff, right? Because I think that a lot of the backlash you're seeing in like the last year or so is actually, I think one of the things that makes it particularly um, uh, strong is because a lot of those people were people who maybe at the beginning, you know, from 20, they, they would have been an early adopter of like Bitcoin or at least interested in it and understood the, the concepts. So I think that, that, um, and I mean, like I said, John Gilmore was one of the EFS founders. I mean, as you can probably tell, I'm British. I came over to San Francisco around about 2000. And I mean, I had been tracking this stuff since I was a you know, the mid eighties, um, when I was a kid, like just a teenager getting these like weird fanzines from, from America, like no internet, like no real cross fertilization. Like the only thing you would get would be like TV shows and no TV shows was covering this stuff. So we get these weird zines about strong encryption <laughs> And so I knew a little bit about the cypherpunks movement. So as a journalist, as I was then, I would like start hanging around with that gang. Um, and it was past kind of peak 
cypherpunk in 2000, but it was still going on. And a lot of the people I met there and became friends with um, ended up being a lot of the key figures in what for me is like the reanimation of that movement in the 20, 2010s. So both EFF and me personally have been around like before Bitcoin was Bitcoin. Um, so you've got to see a lot of those threads come back and threads that honestly, I think a lot of us assumed were just been proved to be um, unimplementable. Like at the point when Bitcoin, the Satoshi paper came out, m a huge number of people had taken their eye off that particular ball because we'd just gone, we tried, mm. didn't work out. You know, the internet is now kind of Facebook and Google and is very different from that original vision. I guess it was a, a dead end. And then it all came back to life again. Is that because of like maybe the experience of watching like David Chom? In his, uh, I forgot what it was, yeah. Big Gold or uh, e Cash uh, Cash? Digicash. Cash, Digicash. Actually, so it was Digicash. And so there was like, I mean, you can imagine how ridiculously early this was. I mean, even the uh, the PayPal mafia, like the original idea of PayPal was much more kind of Bitcoin-y like. Um, yeah. So the kind of ideological framing was there. Like people really wanted to do this thing. Um, do you think that's why like Peter Thiel and Elon Musk have been sort of like <laughs> into, into crypto? Well, I mean, the, yeah. And like, you know, we should get into this a little bit, right? Because like one of the things that I think is sort of, you know, when, when Evgeny is sort of saying um, that, that, which we haven't gone into all the drama about that, but maybe we can thread it as a theme. Um, I know he listens to the podcast, so he's waiting for us to mention him again. Um, the, um, you know, part of the theme here is like, does, does the kind of ideology and does the, the, the mental model of cryptocurrencies and blockchain and stuff like that, um, is it, permanently tied to a kind of right-wing vision and um uh so so yeah you know teal and and elon musk and that lot you know were i mean they were i'm i doubt that they went to the cypherpunk meeting because it was kind of like grungy right it wasn't people making money it was people kind of you know to it's it's like a, when you join the socialist workers party is and you're all sit in a pub somewhere i this is a very british analogy but like you know when you're sitting there after having given out the pamphlets and you're all sitting there like you know grimly smoking your roll-up cigarettes right like i think that's the way to think of like the cypherpunks meetings mm. as much as anything else right these are not very people informal are making money they're just informal and kind of like people talking kind of intently and a little bit crazily about ideas mm. um anyway but it's still in the milieu right it's still you know it's you would i mean i heard about it in the uk so there was an there was a chain of interest and like the only reason i would have heard about it was like half interested in politics and as like a you know, a teenager, like understood public key and crypto or half understood public key cryptography enough to know that there was something significant here. And in that setting with that limited set of media, like who are you going to turn to, right? Like you sit there and you read something um, and you go, holy shit, this is just what I was thinking. I was like totally thinking this with my, you know, you might be able to build like a secure, totally stateless environment right um so these things are in the air then you meet people who have that at least in common with you and then you get very excited because you've kind of met your 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 people um and then you discover that some of the people that you've met have extremely crazy ideas <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then as it grows yeah. like that kind of forks and, and grows well, that's, so. that's what i'm curious to hear about like did you at least in the time that you were with these people with the cypherpunks in their you know in their pubs um hanging out and, and drinking you know a pint of beer i guess did you get the impression that it was like a 
I, know, I guess right wing libertarian dominated space. So I think I think one of the and like again like not to dunk on Evgeny, but like I think that there is a model where there's a sort of and actually this isn't what I I don't want to miss miss represent what Evgeny thinks, but like, I think you can fall into this sort of conspiracy theory model of like, you know, Peter Thiel is the puppeteer or whatever. And I think that, that actually, and and, uh, so this is the link with Evgeny. So my actual point that I was making before I got denounced was that Evgeny had tweeted something along the lines of like, this is why I don't think the left should really get involved in crypto. And I think to poorly reiterate his argument is it was kind of like there's nothing there, right? It's all scam or it's just there are more useful ways of achieving uh, a leftist or a socialist like model. And I kind of went in and went, you know, like I can totally understand that, right? Because it's not, it doesn't, the, the meshing is not immediate, right? Like you have to do a lot of thinking about how this might fit into a traditional socialist model of political change. Um, but even if that's the case, I think that the um, there's a huge amount of ideological shift that you can do and learning that you can do just by being in that space at the beginning. And it's always the beginning. Like this is the other lesson from a million decades, right? Is that like I in 2001 was sitting there going, well, I guess I missed the great cypherpunk like renaissance. I'm just like here in the drag ends, you know? And I mean, lit- literally, right? Like I was turning up to these things and people were going, ah, oh, it was good two years ago, but now <laughs> like people just don't like these are just, and, um, and so it's always this moment of, of expansion and development and sophistication. And I think that if you don't get involved, whatever your political stripe, like in the early nineties, and I think one of the reasons why the internet kind of turned out a little bit libertarian for, um, you know, decades really was because of the initial conditions. And it wasn't that like the internet was, well, maybe it was particularly appealing to that political viewpoint. Right. But, it was also weirdly empty of leftist discourse. And as soon as I said this, like people came in going, well, I was there, you know, what about me? Um, And, you know, absolutely true. Incredible amounts of like interesting um, uh, leftist conversations and analysis, right? But not the same level of kind of like mainstream adoption and engagement with its consequences. So... Um, the, so, I mean, just to kind of give you a feel, right? Like there was a a strong theme and I'm not like judging anyone in this, in the space at all. Right. I'm not even my, my politics, my own personal politics kind of oscillate wildly. But, uh, one thing that you would definitely say, I think is that the more, um, syndicalist or anarchist sort of side of the socialist project right was was there on the internet much more early right and you know the tail end of that was occupy but the beginning of that was like indie media um a lot of like the um uh, uh wto protests were online you know zapatistas right that was the kind of milieu of people who quickly joined the internet and saw um saw an advantage here um the green movement as well um Actually, a huge chunk of the early political UK internet was driven by the Green Party. And um, part of that is like opportunistic, right? Part of that is like, well, we don't have avenues that we have in standard political discourse, right? Like we're not winning elections, so let's try this out. But a lot of it was down to, I think, mainstream left thought, not really having a good box to put the internet and technology into to to begin with right um and so because of that there wasn't a great deal of engagement and because of that there wasn't really a huge level of like the theory didn't change to take into account the internet i'm a i'm a great believer in technology as a, a, a as a 
So technology is the thing that, that turns up that's new, right? The new machinery, social, digital, whatever. And I feel that using technology changes your political outlook frequently, right? It gives you a capability that you didn't have before. And not only do you say, okay, here's my politics. This capability will allow me to spread my politics or implement my politics. But it also makes you go, actually, I now think that, to give an example, you know, we might be able to self-organize without a central cadre, or, you know, we might be able to achieve political change um, outside the state. And it's very natural for a technology that sort of at first glance, like fits your ideology, like the, you know, the, the, just to pluck an example, like the free speech opportunities of the internet meant that a lot of people who were super into the internet were also super into free speech. Um, and then their model of free speech changed uh, by using the internet. Well, um, there just weren't a, there weren't as many people as I wanted from a leftist milieu engaging with the internet at that stage and having their model of change and how, how their theory like be affected by that. Anyway, my point here is, is that it's really important for me, I feel for leftists to engage with this and use the technology so that um, you can better you, you you can better use it as a way to achieve things, but also because I think it will change how you think about things. Yeah, I, I think that that sort of summarizes um, my thoughts as well. Like, technology facilitates also new social relations. Um, right. And so, like, I I'm not a I, I hate that I have to repeat it because I feel like people think that I am, but I'm not like a techno determinist, of course. But neither am I like right. a, a social determinist. Like I don't think that we right. can just like believe our way into socialism or like just like we just need to um, socialize in a particular way and that will create political change without any consideration of technology at all. I mean, it's like if, if you are considering, if, you need, want, if you're worried about the material conditions, that's just like inherently what you have to think about. Well, I think one of the things that, that probably the internet, but possibly a lot of like technological advances, right? If you are attracted to technology, you get drawn into it. I think one of the big dividing lines that that causes politically is um, Jonathan Smucker, who is this really interesting kind of uh, activist strategist. Um, uh, I think he ended up sort of advising on 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 the 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 bernie campaign but he's 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 done a lot of thinking about this and he he i think he, he, a lot of his outlook came from after occupy kind of trying to regroup the left and go okay like we didn't achieve a set of goals in occupy um how do we go about achieving our goals in that that kind of period um, and he sort of puts the, he 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 makes this this division between um, prefigurative pre, uh, prefigurative politics and uh, policy politics, right? And the idea of policy politics is your traditional. I mean, not necessarily within just exclusively within the democratic system, but you're trying to achieve change by changing what the state or what government and what people do, right? Um, prefigurative politics is sort of where you, 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 you are the change that you want to see in the world, right? Like you go, okay, if we're going to do, you're an anarchist, right? So you, uh, if we want an anarchist society, the best thing we can do is to build a small version, an element of that, um, in our current lives, right. Um, and organize, um, in that way. And therefore we kind of set the example and then it spreads that way. And I think it's fair to say that Jonathan is um, down on that, right? <laughs> like, is I mean, he, that's kind of his critique of Occupy. It's like you kind of try to do that. You have consensus meetings in um, in tent encampments, and that did not spark the revolution that you wanted. It's we should actually organize to use the existing systems to achieve change. Um, and of course, you know. 
both of those things, preferably simultaneously, are kind of important. Um, but I think the thing with technology, particularly user empowering technology, technology gives you additional powers, um, leans people towards that prefigurative model, right? And you definitely see that in Web3 and crypto, right? The feeling that you get is like, holy shit, I can like build a way, as you say, of socially organizing right here, right now. And that will spread, or at least it'll give me a chance to like live out my values. Um, and I think, t I, I think any technology that, that empowers you in a new way, you know, from literacy <laughs> onwards, like gives you, gives you that, that feeling. Is it, is it, um, is it too heady a feeling, right? Are there like, you know, countervailing economic and social pressures that doom that to failure? Um, I, 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 you know, I mean, I'm, my heart is always in the prefigurative side. Um, I think one of the things going into the, like the crypto and web three th world is like, oh, you are fully in prefigurative mode. Maybe you need to think a little bit more <laughs> about like, you know, what happens when this fails or like how to and, get And how policy values. affects the, the whole. Yeah, the whole absolutely. Thing. That's right. I mean, especially right. right now, recently it's having a huge impact. Yeah. And, 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 you know, not just in that kind of, okay, we have to organize to stop dumb bills going through, which, you know, has been, again, drawing on my my time at the EFF. That's kind of what the the EFF, if if people know about it, that's what they do. And, I mean, to, to give, like, a pointed example, right? So if you imagine, like, the libertarian-y kind of, like um, – I think it's not just libertarian, but kind of like the 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 standard two thousands techno techno optimism, right? Um, I think one of the things about that was that it was very of its time and very fertile. It came up with a lot of like akin ideas again with with cypherpunks. Um, I think from two thousand and eight onwards, it was pretty clear to me that um, that was seeding away and that it was actually the online left and the left in general who were coming up with who were in their period of most kind of like um uh, fertile expression like you know in the it, were engaging with the world as it was then what examples um, like come to mind for you during that time i mean just you know i, I just the 2008 financial crash right yeah. like you know, there was a whole community, like, you know, there's a reason why people see that as the twilight of kind of the neoliberal point of view, because right. that was something that was both kind of unpredicted and inexplicable and unjustifiable, even in it's, uh, even in the kind of social contract that, that, that the neoliberal model had. It, it's Whereas, maybe like in interesting slash kind of depressing maybe for me is that um, it was only until you, we had this monumentous, economic crash where like right. the internet was taken a little bit more seriously i guess from a left-wing political point of view well i mean you know there's always like a generational change but like i also think that like i mean there was a lot in the i mean i so my 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 parents met at a communist party dance right and i i grew up but like i wasn't quite a red diaper baby but but i i you know i definitely was raised in a in a, a leftist tradition um and like being a teenager in the late 80s was a really hard time to be on the left because um like neoliberals in like 2008 like none of like the obvious apparatus that you were using to judge the world was working right there was like the rise of the thatcher reagan kind of working class coalition um you had the collapse of the soviet union um you had like the boom of the 90s that was pursuing all of these things so it was very like your theoretical base and your practical base were very um hard to like kickstart um and again, like if you were cobbling together like a new way of viewing things that was tied to the internet, um, 
you had a lot of like it had a lot of explanatory power right like you you know pretty much anything that you said about the 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 if you had said the internet was going to do well which very few people said right um you had some cachet of prediction like you were like oh you're a genius right like because you said that and it would be complete unrelated to the actual reasons the internet grew you just you you were just the cool people right um 2008 i think that the 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 weight and the impetus and the fertility came to the left again the um i think there's this great thing by brad delong who i think might describe himself as a neoliberal economist right or at least you know a clinton a clinton economist um where he sort of goes the baton has now passed right like we had our go like we kind of fucked up like there were definitely things we got wrong and like now it's the it's the left's opportunity to shine because their analysis actually fits the way the world is now um from somebody kind of dealing with internet issues right my my primary thought in that space was um it's going to be a nightmare if the left gets the internet wrong right and you know that's entirely possible right like you 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 know in this moment of fertility like nobody the thing people can believe crazy fucking shit right <laughs> and like if you if you if you aren't like if if before your theory, theory hits the ground right like you you may make mistakes and it would be very bad to back out of those mistakes the one that that i think the bullet that i was most worried about and the left successfully dodged but it was a close thing and actually the left dodged it and it hit sex workers <laughs> bluntly um was was sesta foster right like um so sesta foster was the first really concerted attempt to um weaken section 230 the uh thing that that gives liability protection to big tech companies and um there is a very cohesive argument that you can make that if you are trying to tackle big tech's control over over the internet and also tackle monopolies and antitrust and also kind of um uh, uh, uh beat back um a kind of economic surety or economic influence that those tech companies have removing their liability protections against what the shit people say on them um is a would be a way of doing that actually though <laughs> if you like spend a lot of time thinking about for instance decentralized networks right like if you have a mesh network say or right you have a network that people are passing content around or even just having a discussion forum right um if you think of intermediaries as nodes in a network which is what a decentralized internet how it should work that means everybody is liable for everybody else right it's right. an incredibly everybody sues everyone it, it, <laughs> in that everyone sues everyone there's a huge chilling effect you basically can't like share or interconnect without like spreading the virus of this liability um and uh and also it means that the actual ultimate liability doesn't lie with individuals right it kind of hides like so the people who pay the price aren't the nazis it's the people who host the nazis which sounds fine unless you for instance get a bunch of nazis going okay we're gonna take down this particular community by going entryist tactics, taking it over, and then it gets, then like they get targeted. Anyway, like there's a lot of deep thought that's gone into this this whole thing, and like we spent a long time, both here the FF and more generally in the digital rights community, trying to create a legal environment which would protect decentralized systems. Um, so anyway, so you have this big fork in the road. Do you? save the internet by weakening section 230 and this liability protections or do you 
prefiguratively protect a better decentralized internet that might be that was in the past and will be in the future by maintaining this this legal model and the thing that happened was the first attempt to tackle that was this thing called Sesta Foster and Sesta Foster was um supported by the left and the right because it targeted sex trafficking. And it basically said, if you have sex trafficking on your website, you can be sued for that. And you will have liability for that in the US. Um, And there were lots of arguments on the left that why this should pass. And ultimately it did pass. The thing that everybody who's left politics or any politics have been informed by their knowledge of how the internet works with like, okay, what's going to happen here is that Craigslist, all of these sites, Facebook, all these sites are just going to shut off any discussion of the, that might even have like a hint of sex trafficking. Right. And that will mean sex work discussions of sex work. And it had this catastrophic effect because Suddenly, sex workers can't couldn't discuss what was happening to them. They couldn't um, operate independently of, um, of 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 pimps. Bluntly, um, it sent people back onto the streets. It, it 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 was it was a nightmare, right? And it still is. Um, but I guess you know, and it's always uh, minorities who 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 bear the brunt of the lessons that wider political movements learn is that at least at that point, the left recognized, I think mostly that this was, this was not the route to take to, um, to dismantle or tackle the kind of dominant economic control of these big corporations. Hey everyone, if you're enjoying the episode, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, share with a friend, and join the crypto leftist communities on Discord or Reddit, which you can find links to in the show notes. And if you're enjoying the interview or find the content that I make important, you can pitch into my efforts starting at $3 a month on patreon.com slash the blockchain socialist to help me out and join the newest patrons like Manuel, Yin Wo, and Ennis. Any amount really helps since making this up isn't free in terms of money or time. As a patron, you'll get a shout out on an episode like I just did and access to bonus content like Q&A episodes where you can submit and vote on questions you'd like me to answer. I'll give my thoughts in roughly 20 minutes. Or in the last bonus episode, I actually spoke to two other crypto leftists who went to East Denver and we spoke about their experiences there, including the good, the bad and the ugly. Of course, I'll still be making free content like this interview to help spread the message that blockchain doesn't need to be used to further entrench capitalist exploitation if we put our efforts into it. So if that message resonates with you, I hope you'll consider helping out. I want to talk a bit more about what you were talking about with the, you know, thinking of like decentralized systems. Um, Because you've written a bit about uh, what you called in like some of the EFF blogs, the public interest internet. If we want an internet, which is for like like built in the public the interest people. built for <laughs> right. people yeah um like do you imagine that being a decentralized internet I, i'm i'm using like you know air quotes with that because yeah, like, I, I can see you air quoting <laughs> madly into the, the the microphone there yeah um well because that can mean a lot of different things so, when you say decentralized internet i feel like i know i know and it's sort of such a sort of like uh, a vague term and I never define it and I feel bad defining it um, uh, or feel bad not defining it. But in many ways, like unpacking the whole thing would take like, you know, sometimes you just have to, again, in like making, making points, you sometimes have to not unpack things, right? You have to just go. It's like, I think that, that there's so much complexity to the term open when we talk about the open internet or we talk about, you know, open source even. And uh, there's a great article, which I will send you, um, uh, and you can we can throw it in the, the podcast notes sure. or whatever, which is like someone doing this analysis and going, did anyone actually define this? We had like a whole movement about open data and no one defined it. And like as someone who was in that, that process of advocating for that, it was like, no, and we, we deliberately didn't. Like that it was, it was a phrase that that lots of people could project their own ideals into and that's actually okay sometimes right sometimes you're feeling your way through this and like you know it's a it's a loose definition is that is that because of the like 
technical things that you would have to explain to like properly define that term? No, it's because the possibilities of this movement, this general direction are as yet unexplored. Like one of the hardest things that you have to do. So when I first joined, like I think my first day at EFF was in 2005. And one of the first meetings I went into was there's this project called GNU Radio. Um, and GNU Radio is software, was software, continues to be software defined radio, right? Basically before software defined radio, a radio could do like one thing, right? Like, and you would physically wire like the whole thing up. So you could, and you would wire it in one way and you would plug things in and it would be a television wire it another way it would be a shortwave radio you would wire it another way and it would be like you know a mobile phone and so we have defined radio was this opportunity and continues to be of creating tools that were much more generic than that um and there were a bunch of lawyers sitting with the technologists that built this thing going through what this would mean in 15 years time, right? And like, you have to think at that kind of time scale, partly because that's how long it takes to like prepare and move a lawsuit through the courts. Like the suits about the post 9-11 mass surveillance of the NSA is still going through the courts, right? Um, but partly it's because you're trying to represent, legally represent and sort of politically represent something that has not happened yet, like a potential opportunity. And like people in the crypto community, you're going to be well aware of this, where people are going, what are you defending, right? There's like nothing is happening. You're going, no, but, but like there is this whole thing that I can almost see and is so hard to describe, but I've used the technology. So I have like this fundamental feeling about it that we, we have to, that it's going to happen and we have to get right. So in that, sometimes you have to use terms that are the gesture to that, right? Rather than be able to go, oh yeah, in the future we'll be on like, you know, special buggies or whatever. Um, so uh, decentralization is a little like that. I feel that it's less like that for anyone who's grown up with the internet because what we're really doing is re-decentralizing, right? We're, re we're returning back to something that we already had an existence proof of. So do you agree then with like this narrative? Because like, I mean, I'm personally like unsure of how true it is, but like for the most part, like Web3 hype men a little bit, to be honest, of like Web1 was like our decentralized internet, Web2 was centralization of big tech, and then Web3 is sort of like this re-decentralization through crypto. I think that's ahistorical. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I think that the, uh, I think the problem is is that you can't really divide those, those lines. I mean, um, and there's a lot of, um, there's like a whole mishmash of currents that were going on at the same time and were going in different directions. I mean, I think my model and in those public interest essays, I'm kind of touching on it, although I kind of left EFF in the middle of them, um, is I see the internet as like a fairly classic kind of enclosure of the commons kind of process, right? Um, in which you have this public commons and then people kind of ex increasingly extract from it um, or propertize it. And, and, you know, when Web2 critics are saying this about Web3, that's what they're worried about, right? They're worried about re-seeing a kind of carving up of um, a tokenization of things that were, is the small remains of a, a commons. Now, I don't see it through that that framing. And the reason why is because while that is the story of one of the processes that happened with the internet, the other earlier story is we created a commons, right? Like somehow w the, the, in this very um, air quotes, decentralized way, um, we were able to fashion something that was not um, controlled certainly to, to the extent and with very novel sort of ideas of ownership and participation. Right. Um, 
And I think that is kind of fascinating, right? The ability to create a public good in an uncoordinated, emergent way. And I mean, we can overstate it, and I don't want to sound too like I'm flashing back to my, you know, 90s days right here. But um, uh, a lot of that had to do with like, is it accidental? I think it's like just an existence proof, right? Like there was just like a particular alignment of incentives that made that work. And once you see that happen, and then actually the other thing, see it happen again and again with something like, like the thing, you know, having been embedded, I worked at Wired as well, right? I worked at Wired and EFF. I was certainly embedded with techno utopians during this whole period. And the thing you have to like understand is that, that, um, uh, also a lot of skepticism, like even in that kind of heart of like Silicon Valley ideology. Um, and like lots of people, like if you look at the early version uh, issues of Wired, which is like techno libertarianism is at its peak, none of those people um, thought the web was going to take off, right? They just thought obviously like, you know, academic bollocks, like just there's no mention of the web in the early what was the magazine about in the beginning then? <laughs> um, so kind of like cyber stuff, like, <laughs> okay. like just like, you know, and, and, you know, the, the networks, right. But like there were proprietary networks that competing with the internet. So mm -hmm. before the internet, before the web really took off, um, Microsoft had like this project, which was, I can't remember what it's called. It's named after some fruit or something, um, which was going to be the internet. And like, there was a thing, AOL, of course. Um, there was a company, CompuServe. Um, Rupert Murdoch had his internet ready to go called Delphi. Um, oh, glad so, that didn't happen. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. So you can imagine like the weirdness of this thing succeeding, which, you know, didn't really, I mean, it was kind of government supported, but not really because they just let it go. They just threw it out. There was no kind of, you know, state funding of the internet's growth beyond the DARPA phase, right? It was the assumption that it would like live and die in the free market. And it succeeded against all of these odds. Um, and you kind of assume that that's a sway generous thing, right? You kind of, you, people go, oh, wow, this is amazing. But like, then the web came along and people go, well, yeah, but there's no money in it. Like, 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 you know, one of the, the articles that, that, the, in that, that series that I wrote was trying to convey how most people in the entertainment business or the content business were like, you're going to have to pay us in some way to put content because who's going to put content up for free. And they almost had this sort of boycott of the early internet. I guess they've, they've kind of ended up being right, being afraid of it to a certain extent. Oh, well, yeah, but it wasn't a fear to begin with. Like it was sort of a standoffishness, right? So what would happen is they would go, well, until we get paid, like we're not going to go there. And without like Hollywood content, like your thing is not, we're just going to make these deals with Microsoft and AOL and that's what we're going to do because there's money there. And then, boom, I mean, the example I use is the IMDB, which um, was like a bunch of volunteers. At, uh, well, the server was at Cardiff University and it was, t I mean, in a way that is unsurprising to us now, right? It was like the same as Wikipedia, is that everybody just pulled together and built this thing like, with no central organization or real profit motive, right? And the internet filled with this content, right? Like this novel content that was just sucked in by this new technological capability that people had. And also because it wasn't centrally organized, people could just plug into it, right? Like people would just go, okay, I've dialed up to my SP, but you know what? Like there are all these people over here and they want the internet. So we're going to like, they can connect. Like, so I was in the UK. I was desperate to get onto the internet in the, um, uh, I guess the early nineties and the way the internet came to the UK and most European countries was a bunch of people. It was a company called demon internet and they got like, I think a thousand people to pay 10 pounds a month. 
And that was enough to pay for a single leased line across the Atlantic. And then they found somebody to connect to on the other, like some internet person on the other line. And then everyone connected to that. And so that was the growth pattern of this. And like all the innovation was happening at the edges and, um, and all the incentives aligned to just make this suddenly the global dominant internet. And then, this, as I say, people go, well, that's never going to happen again. And then it would keep happening with things like Wikipedia, Linux, all of these things, until eventually theory has to catch up to this, right? You're sitting there going, okay, this should not happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, like a bunch... Wait, go ahead. I was going to say, this, this sort of shows the um, so many cases where like the libertarian theory was wrong over right, and over again. Right, right. So, so what would happen is that people would adapt their theory to match reality. Um, and some people were quicker at adapting because they could see what was going on. Some people would like arch so far into theory that like, you know, they're now in the dustbin of history because, you know, and I, I, I kind of like, you know, took some of this cool aid, right? Where you're like, oh my God, everything's going to change. We'll just be, you know, this, this is the moment of the prefigurative politics where suddenly everything will be run with a wiki or whatever, right? Um, and, uh, uh, but, but there's some matching of velocity, right? Like you, you have a thing in the world like the financial crisis that needs explaining, and your theory does not explain it. So what do you do? Um, and I think, so uh, interestingly, just to pick on the libertarians a little bit more, right? Like one of the things that happened was that there was a big fork in the road for them about intellectual property. So, you know, intellectual property in many ways is like such a strong, like you say, kind of libertarian model, right? Like let's extend property rights to... Um, Ideas, <laughs> ideas, right? <laughs> um, but um, it was pretty clear that to kind of f follow, I think one of the transformative effects the early internet had was for anybody who went through it was to realize how poor a fit copyright was and copyright law was for this new model. And so you mm -hmm. had this fork in the road where, um, and actually I would say that this is one of the places where I think um, – the left, I mean, maybe maybe kind of the liberal left, but the left had a head start, right? Because they had a much better model of what uh, a copyright, an intellectual property regime that 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 had a a functional public benefit model um, would would look like. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that actually, if you look back, you know, the IP start of that, which again, the Electronic Frontier Foundation was super in the lead, like trying to defend people who were getting like sued to hell and back by, by Hollywood and that whole phase. Um, I think that that was far more informed by a kind of traditional uh, uh, liberal academic kind of analysis of IP. Yeah, it, it is really interesting seeing like how, just like n knowing more about like the, the things that divide other political tendencies is kind of interesting. Like how right. some libertarians are very, very anti-intellectual property, which is very, it's like weird and interesting. That doesn't really fit. Right, right. And I think, you know, it gives you some idea of like cultural complexity and cultural contingencies, right? Like, I think it's very easy to view these things like uh, you know i'm not again i'm comparing myself to evgeny i'm not dumping on evgeny but like i think that Ev evgeny as an academic sees these as like the battle of ideas right and that people are um well i i think he uses a phrase you know there are idiots all around us right and like so there are some people who were like you know the ideas ride them like lower to use a Gibsonian kind of like analogy, right? Like you, you, the ideas are the things that are doing battle. And then there are people who are sort of manipulating that idea scape to achieve their ends. Adam Curtis, I think is also kind of, um, in that, that kind of mold where I kind of, um, and, and like, this is my background, both as a journalist and, you know, ultimately like, you know, 
again, my weird history in this is that I started doing stand-up comedy about the internet and doing a gossip newsletter about the internet is that I sort of see this whole thing as much more drowned in bathos <laughs> in, the, in this whole thing, right? Where like the crazy thing about being in San Francisco during this whole period is how many of the ideas that people were mulling over and chewing over um, were just like, you know, again, like dumb, weird things that people had come up with in conversations in, you know, dive bars in, you know, Hey Ashbury. Um, and, but, but they, 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 they inflate at the same size as the internet or some other like moment happens. Right. So the, seed ideas of the very early ideas of web three of satoshi all of these things have a disproportionate influence on the next generation um and the inconsistencies about those or the things that people sort of think about are the things that define the divide those groups and you know of course like everybody who studied like the history of the left knows that this is like this weird combination of the personal and the political. Um, and I wish that there were more stories that took that line, right. Of like, rather than going here is sinister Peter Thiel, or here is like, you know, um, the, the libertarian cypherpunks with their guns or whatever, and looks more at the, uh, the, the personalities. It's not like a great man history of the world. It's like, an understanding of like, oh, if this person had had done this at this point or worked with this person or this community had got involved at this early stage. I really, honestly, my biggest critique of Web3 and all of this coming into it is, and I think this is a valid Web2 criticism of people who've learned Web2, is like... um it's not a lack of diversity, but a lack of connecting with people who really, um, in, 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 from a theoretical point of view, should stand to benefit the most, right? The people who I would describe on the periphery of the existing kind of centralized internet. And like, it's not us, right? Like we actually, we're kind of like the perfect target demographic for the centralized internet, right? Like, you know, the ads they sell to us are high paying ads. Um, we have more influence in that space, like, and we feel helpless. Um, what does it mean to be, and like, I just, I'm just going to refuse to do the roll call of like my, you know, minorities and like marginalized people, because I just feel like every time I do that, I'm like doing this weird grab bag of like, oh yeah, indigenous, blah, blah, blah. Right. But like, you have to like the t the rubber has to hit the road, right? Like there has to be this point where we have this technology, which it, and it really does empower someone who was not previously empowered. And I think some of that is happening with m money, the raw power of money, which I also don't think that Web two like one of the privileges of Web two is like oh well we'll make a Wikipedia together, right? Because we have endless free time and we have a well paid tech job, right? Like and or or we're a neat, right? Like we're 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 living off welfare and also on the internet all the time, um, like <laughs> so the web we have right now is constructed from people's spare time. Um, and that privilege, right? And one of the beauties, I think, of the Web3, which people don't take into account, is it does make people rich, right? And like, sometimes it makes the wrong people rich, but sometimes it makes rich people richer, but sometimes it's utterly transformative to whole communities because they were never going to get a tech job at Google, right? Like that avenue has completely shut off, Right. Um, and th that kind of like people can be transformed and communities can be transformed with access to resources. And that doesn't mean they suddenly become capitalists or they suddenly become rich bastards, right? Like there has to be a way that you can distribute resources and capabilities to people without them being the enemy or them being corrupted. Um, uh, but the but but definitely one of the paths to corruption is just to go. I'm making a lot of money, so I'm fine now. Which is the path that you see so many Web three people 
end up taking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have, I have so many. I'm actually really curious to hear about because you were recently at ETH Denver, right? Um, how how that went? Because the <laughs> well, I got COVID, so that was a bit of a downer. <laughs> yeah, um, but I heard like everyone. It was, everyone a, got it was COVID a bit of a super spreader event. I think <laughs> that like, if if I one of the things I took away from ETH Denver for when I was there was like I got caught up in the excitement and the optimism and like maybe the rules can be rewritten. And then I got COVID afterwards and I went, okay, some rules cannot be rewritten. <laughs> like something you cannot get through with just blind techno optimism. I guess I've learned that lesson once again. <laughs> but it was yeah. great. Bitcoin doesn't doesn't solve COVID, unfortunately. <laughs> right, right. This is like, or, or you know, just really believing in something does not solve it. Um, you you eventually the facts hit 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 you in the literally in the face. Um, and yeah. I mean to 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 draw the theme, um, you know, the thing that made ETH Denver exciting was lots of people were seeing this technology through the lens of being able to create public goods and group being able to create new commons. And I think that's a fundamental disconnect between people who on the left to get this and people who don't get it is that I think if you don't get it, you see it as a big pile of scams. You see it as, you mm-hmm. know, Ponzi schemes, you see it as libertarianism and enclosure writ large, right. Mm-hmm. Um, that everything gets monetized. But the flip side of that is that, you know, right from the Satoshi paper, right, is you look at it through another lens and it's the creating of a public good, right? Like the whole point of the distributed ledger is you've suddenly created something that's in every, every everybody's interest to maintain and therefore kind of exists without like the usual propping up that you would, re- re- without the policy propping up that you would expect. Right. And Almost everybody I know who's excited about this on, on from a sort of social liberatory kind of view looks at it as as this thing that enables you to create and maintain public goods, perhaps in a way that is stable and can defend it in a sense it's itself against rentiers, against capture, against enclosure. Mm. Yeah, I think um, what the, a lot of this public good talk comes from, to me, it seems is like an actual legitimate issue of like funding open source projects. Right, right. So, so these, yeah, these are all the failures, the failures that, 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 that we experienced in Web2, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like there's only one Wikipedia there should be more than one Wikipedia, right? Like, like, um, and, uh, uh, yeah. And the, the, the Linux project and open source projects have this tense relationship with, Mm -hmm. um, with big tech. Right. Right. Um, and you know, honestly, I feel like on the web three side, I think people under, understate how transformative things like patreon and kickstarter are right like i mean i always in the same way as people go oh you know what's you know blockchain is just like why not use a database there's a lot of dao activity where i'm just like you know you could have just done a kickstarter with this right or a gofundme um but the pernicious problem was the assumption that if you built it then if the, the, the incentives are aligned to build something, that that thing would just continue along that path. And the story of the internet is even if you get everything magically aligned so you can create a digital public good from nothing, right? From just everybody, you know, just participating the way that they want to and like suddenly we've built the world's biggest knowledge base, right? Um it, it, it might not persist in that way, right? That might not continue. And I think the, the story of the next 10 to 20 years is that division between profligative politics and, and policy politics, right? There's going to be regulation um, and there should be regulation, right? Um, this isn't a libertarian place where we can't, where the state can be somehow ignored or under, under my, uh, 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 you know, dissolved overnight. So there's going to be regulation, um, and 
Uh, and then there's this prefigurative model, which is like, but we can also continue this project, right? Like it's all the same project. It's not web one, two, three. It's like, it's the same direction. Um, and that direction is how do we understand better how to make things that can spontaneously and emergently arise and build a thing that everybody wants? And how do we carefully craft the incentives so that that can persist and defend itself against attack over time. Um, and, you know, both of those are, are tools in the toolkit of building a society that is stable and equitable um, and, and flexible, right? Like, that's the other thing that I think we have to understand is, like, how can we, having built these systems that can continue, how can they change? And evolve. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And... Um, like again, the biggest criticism people have, and I think it's a, I think it's a valid criticism. I've heard counter arguments, but is sort of the energy usage of Bitcoin uh, or other proof of work um, uh, systems. And for me, that feels like you know one of those incentive wirings that's just a little out of whack, and therefore it, the problem gets bigger and bigger over time. Like if you look at the cypherpunks mailing list and the Satoshi paper, I think. Um, I think it's right in say, I'm right in saying that in the thread afterwards, people are going, hmm, I think like yeah. Ben Laurie or someone is sitting there going, huh, isn't this going to use up a fuck of a lot of energy? Yeah, yeah I <laughs> and, mean, you know, I guess, it's yeah, there, it's just, right? It's, it's completely set up to where it can go. There's no cap on the amount of energy that can be used for it, theoretically. Yeah, and like, but the thing is, you in order to kind of calculate that, you have to go, well, let's assume that like a single Bitcoin will cost like $50,000. And like, how do you have the long-term thinking and like the, not optimism, but the the ability to not just disregard these things, right? That's that's the fundamental problem here, right? Is that what I'm trying to avoid is people going, oh, this is stupid, right? Like this will never take off, right? Um, and you have to walk this line between, um, you know, just to the moon where you just go, oh my God, like I totally believe that this is going to take over everything, right? And going, well, what if it does? Like, what does that, how does that change things? How do, how do we learn to live with that? Um, or how do we stop it if you, if you think along those lines? And how do we build a better society given that this is now in the world? Um, and you have to do that early because you, that's how you learn and that's how you change your outlook to uh, update it to, to the world that you live in now. Yeah, that is um, 100% <laughs> like uh, <laughs> what I was trying to do with this project. Uh, yeah. That was uh, said, said much better than I probably could have said it. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's it's always good to be on a podcast where like we all agree. We need to grab <laughs> Evgeny, right? Like, I mean, presumably he thinks I'm like, so we should end the story. So Evgeny, <laughs> like the story was, is that like I was DMing Evgeny after like I wrote my thing and I went, hey, Evgeny, we should go out for a drink. Like, you know, I don't want to, like, you know, have, like, a big Twitter fight, like, be a problem. And then you followed me seconds later. And Evgeny was going, yeah, let's go out for a drink, blah, blah, blah. And then he mentioned you. And um, and then I was, like, on, like, I'd never heard it. I mean, I'd heard of you, but, like, we hadn't, like, met or anything. And I was on DMs with both of you going, oh, this is weird. Like, you're both talking to me. And then I mentioned that. Evgeny had maybe implied a thing that maybe you didn't exist. <laughs> and I was kind of like, this is hilarious. Like, like he thinks you don't exist. And like me going, Evgeny, I think that they exist. I mean, I don't think I even said that, but, but like, you know, this weird, again, this existence proof, we're going pretty sure this guy's for real. I mean, like, you know, we maybe should update our knowledge to, and then, and then in the thread afterwards, people were going, well, maybe Danny O'Brien is the blockchain socialist. Of that. Did you see that bit? Oh, I man. Think, I think I, I, think I, I like need a couple to spend say that. less time on Twitter. But like, unless this is a very artfully put together podcast, I think we've proven that we're different. <laughs> You're really good at uh, hiding your British accent. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Just very good audio kind of like cutting. Yeah. 
anyway, I, I like so I will do two quick two quick plugs because we talk about the public interest stuff a lot and um, EFF. I'm still doing a podcast for EFF called How to Fix the Internet. Also, I'm I'm I, I work at the Falcon Foundation for the Decentralized Web. If you have projects that you think will make the world a better place, uh, ping me because we are trying to bring all of this together into a cohesive shared whole and um, and I really want to support projects that, that that hit the ground running that really tackle the people who need this need the technology to change most and learning with them what we should be building cool yeah thanks a lot for, for taking the time and um, Thank you. Yeah, it was great to talk to you and have Thank you.